Hello, this is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy with yet another episode of Marxism, the good kind of Marxism with fellow editors and fellow Marx, Mark Lavecki and hey. Mark Melton. And today we will review uh, several items of accomplishment from Providence uh, over the last week, including a uh, wonderful summary of eight points regarding Christian realism from Eric Patterson, a Providence contributing editor, an interview with the Portuguese political thinker uh, Bruno Maches on his new book uh, the, about the birth of a new America, about uh, Habib Malik, the uh, famous Lebanese writer, uh, some commentary from him on Lebanon's future, and uh, finally uh, a few words about uh, Christian ethics and vigilantism. So fellow Marx, and especially you, uh, Mark Lavecki, Eric Patterson's uh, review of eight points, central points for Christian realism, how do they contrast uh, with, uh, I believe, the 11 central points of Christian realism that you offered a few weeks ago? I don't know if they, do they contrast? I think they compare favorably. Mm. But, uh, They're not I, at I, odds, but they're slightly different. They are slightly different. I am going to produce the five points of Christian realism for next week, I think. I'm going to boil it down even further, and then eventually they'll just be a point. Yes. Which is, I think, exciting. Uh, all the topics that we're going to talk about that I want to talk about today, uh, and this might point to Melton's genius, I think there are significant points of overlap. And one of them is this idea that Eric touches on with Christian realism not being a, uh, a sort of a, a self-determined school of thought with its, with its key founders, its point of origin, its strict dogma. Uh, instead, it has its dogma, uh, but the dogma manifests in, in more supple ways, more fluid ways, ways that are, are case specific. I think there's a value in that. So uh, Patterson, points out that Christian realism is a, a, I think he calls it a community of thinking, which is to say that there, there's not a totalitarian way of thinking about being a Christian realist. So I could be a Christian realist, Reinhold Niebuhr can be a Christian realist, Patterson can, and there's points of overlap, of course, that, that can identify us as uh, thinking similarly, uh, but there's, there's not a assertive, you have to think this way, otherwise you ain't a Christian realist, right? And that's going to manifest, I think, in important ways in Habib Malik's piece about Lebanon and the requirements of free thought in Lebanese society. I think it manifests in uh, the book interview you did where he talks about the American ability to reimagine itself and to think in unique and entrepreneurially, even morally entrepreneurial ways. Uh, I think that's an essential element of, of uh, Christian intellectual uh, history and theology. Uh, Paul Ramsey famously or infamously, uh, but certainly provocatively, said that Christianity is a, is a faith without rules. And he didn't mean that quite literally, but he didn't sort of mean it entirely uh, unliterally. So, he, you know, he'll say there are rules, but the rules are things like love. What's that mean? Well, it's going to be situationally dependent, and you're going to have to have the subtlety, uh, the subtlety of thought and the suppleness of of thought to be able to identify the ways that this particular situation, which is somewhat unique in history, requires that I love. Uh, I think that was one of the strengths of Eric's piece that I probably didn't emphasize. It's being a loose cadre of thinkers shaped by uh, certain commitments, uh, but not dogmatically held by anyone. Excellent, you wrapped up everything for us uh, this Very. week. And uh, we will elaborate further in uh, Monday evenings Christian Realism Happy Hour with yourself, Eric Patterson, and Daniel Strands. So everyone who's listening now, tune in Monday evening at 5.30. I have been invited to participate in the happy hour on Keith Pavlicek's porch, which I suppose will mean it will be a true happy hour, at least with Pavlicek and Levecki. So, are there going to be smoked meats? Well, are there going to be smoked meats for you? I don't know if there'll be smoked meats. I hope so. There'll be, uh, yeah. Well, uh, exercise restraint in every regard, as a Christian realist should. We'll uh, 
quickly touching on my interview with this uh, Portuguese political thinker, uh, Bruno Machess and his uh, new book, History Has Begun, The Birth of a New America, which Mark Lebecki just summarized uh, in that it's uh, rather hopeful and a tonic to mm. America's uh, current peptimism by uh, asserting that uh, even the current turmoil, uh, social upheaval in America is simply just another chapter in America's constant reinvention of itself, that from the very beginning, uh, especially when the Puritans first step foot uh, in New England uh, through uh, the uh, Westerns of uh, John Ford. Americans love uh, creating their own new reality, which often can be uh, disconcerting and uh, offer a dramatic zigzag, and yet it's um, constantly unfolding and uh, adaptable, and it means America never gets old and the world is uh, simultaneously appalled and uh, fascinated by it. So I found uh, his analysis as a uh, Portuguese observer, uh, insightful and uh, helpful. What did you, uh, Mark Melton, having reviewed uh, his last book, uh, what was your response? I think he's a very interesting speaker because, as you said, you know, he's coming from a Portuguese perspective. He was also, I believe, in the foreign ministry. Like, so he served in government in Portugal. And so he looks at this not just from an ivory tower perspective, but also from a having done work in the trenches of government, which I think sometimes can be missing in academia, at least in some of my conversations with people. And... Uh, so yeah, like the idea of you know, America being renewed, it reminds me a bit about a book I read last year, um, I think with Albion Seed, where it talks about basically there are four different types of America and they kind of come to the fore in different ways. Um, so you have like the Puritans, so this very idea of like a moralistic vision. You also have like the the Tidewater, like so the Southern um, slaveholders and their vision of what America meant. And they came from different parts of the United Kingdom at different times. And then you also have like the backcountry people who came from like the borders of Scotland in this lawlessness area. And they kind of brought their ethos of what all these things meant. And Walter Russell Mead actually brings in some of the some of these ideas from that book into his idea that we've talked about the four schools of foreign policy. And so this idea of like America regenerating itself, I sometimes wonder, is it regenerating itself or are different parts of these um, old historical root, cultural roots that come from the United Kingdom at, and those people who came over, did, did they kind of come to the fore in different ways at different times? And are we looking today at a new uh, realignment of these different groups. And so that's kind of my first thought. And I'm excited to you know, read this book. Um, like I said, or like you said, I read the previous book, which kind of talks about Belt and Road and China's foreign policy. And, and so with that, kind of looking at the competition of different ideas, I think that's one of the things he said, if I remember correctly. And the last thing is that there's going to be globally, this new competition of ideas is not going to be the world looking like America. And so this book will be interesting to kind of consider and dive into his thoughts and perspectives. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Mark Melton. Uh, Mark Levecki, I want to ask you about uh, Habib uh, Malik, who of course is the son of the great Lebanese thinker, uh, Charles Malik, who helped to craft the UN's Declaration on uh, Human Rights, uh, but uh, the younger Malik, as his father is um, very devoted to uh, his nation of Lebanon and uh, of course distressed about his nation's future at this point, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I, I have appreciated his passion in every article that he's written for us. Uh, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's an element of tragedy in it, which I find uh, at, at one level incredibly disheartening. You know, he paints this picture of a Lebanon of incredible possibility, of incredible potential. Uh, you know, Robert Nicholson is, uh, and I think Luke Moon as well in our pages have talked eloquently about Lebanon, uh, the incredible pluralism, uh, you know, in, in many ways, the religious tolerance that's there contrasted by, uh, you know, gross injustices, uh, contrasted by being in, in many ways, uh, you know, a, a puppet of the Iranian regime. Uh, and so his passion comes out and, and I think it's powerful. And I, I think what the, the, the main takeaway, especially reading it uh, through the lens of the various articles this week that jumps out is the need in Lebanon uh, or Lebanese society 
for for free thinkers, uh, for an opportunity for for freedom of expression and 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 people's own free desires uh, to be articulated, that Lebanon and and the Lebanese people should be given an opportunity uh, to be self-determining. You know, what direction are we going to go? Are we going to align with some of the Western Arab states uh, and and finally, you know, make peace with Israel? Uh, he points to the tragic. Uh, well, first to the hopeful history back in the day when everybody assumed of all the nations, Lebanon is going to be the first Arab nation uh, to, to make peace with Israel. Now it's way down the list uh, or at the bottom of the list. Uh, and Habib Malik just simply calls for the opportunity for Lebanese people to be able to speak their mind. Um, free of the cartels, you know, free of the regime. What do we want? And then to be given the opportunity to pursue that. Um, so it's a you know it's an aspirational piece i don't know the conditions on the ground well enough to know whether or not it's it's tethered to a realistic possibility um but it's it's you know it's a it's a powerful piece and then uh, almost finally uh mark levecki conducted an interview with uh, just war scholar uh, keith pavlicek about uh, vigilantism uh, tell us just a little bit about that mark levecki yeah, it, it originated from a conversation on Keith's back porch uh, with Smoked Meats about Rittenhouse and media perceptions. Remind us who Rittenhouse is. Rittenhouse is a 17-year-old boy who was in Kenosha uh, doing a variety of different things. He's, he's a lifeguard in Kenosha. After his, his shift, he went uh, with, an, with a, a semi-automatic rifle to help a group of citizens protect various buildings that were under threat. The police had withdrawn from the area. They had sort of cordoned off a section. And Rittenhouse ostensibly was there to do, um, you know, property protection. But he was also there. He he's, has some training, I guess, uh, due to his lifeguard work uh, in, in emergency medical. And so he was there also to help some of the protesters who were being tear gassed and various things. So I think there's, there's footage of him giving people uh, aid uh, to recover from some of the, the, the um, uh, tear gas. Uh, but at some point he gets involved in an altercation with some people who I think were burning a dumpster and he goes running over to them with a fire extinguisher. Nobody seems to know what happens immediately next. But the next thing we know, there's, there's cell phone footage of him being chased by a man. He has his weapon. The man has like a plastic bag filled with something. Uh, throws a bag at him, there's shots that are fired, turns out that those probably weren't Rittenhouse's shots. The next thing we know, the man who was chasing Rittenhouse charges him again, is shot, other shots occur, he's shot by Rittenhouse, other shots occur, now we're not sure who exactly has hit this guy, but the guy is dead. Rittenhouse runs off, is chased by a group of people, he falls, he's attacked by several of these people. Uh, one of them tries to brain him with a skateboard, he shoots that man and another man then approaches with a firearm and pauses sort of raises his hands Rittenhouse is pointing his weapon at him when the man raises his hands he begins to lower the muzzle the man charges again Rittenhouse fires once and hits him in the elbow I believe uh, and then gets up runs off and runs to the police to turn himself in uh, and to presumably keep himself safe the police bypass him because they hear the shots, they ignore him completely. Eventually he goes home and then eventually he turns himself in. He has now been, in, I think, indicted on uh, several charges of, I think, first degree murder. And this exercised Keith. He wanted to know, you know, was this just? And he did his own research into the situation. And he wanted to talk about vigilanteism a little bit and how that might be different, which is the accusation made against right now. So he's just a vigilante. So he wants to know what is vigilanteism? What is self-defense? Where do they, you know, where do the, the lines begin to blur and where do they sharply contrast? Uh, that was the start of the conversation, but we quickly moved from there to conversations about the responsibilities of uh, local authorities to create a situation in which a 17-year-old kid uh, doesn't take it into his head to try to go and protect buildings that ought to be protected by um, established authorities, police authorities, and the like. So what happens in these sort of uh, vacuums uh, and and you know, when citizens decide to take it upon themselves to do what the police ought to be doing. Uh, we talk about that. We uh, invoke John Ford, just as your interviewee did. Uh, so John Ford gets two mentions this week in Providence and, and you know, what it looks like when institutions 
are unjust? How do individuals rise up to try to uh, ameliorate some of that? We talk about some of the distinctions that are touched on in your interview between fact and, and legend uh, and how with the role that plays in American society. So there's some overlap there. Uh, you know, it's Keith and it's me, so it's, it's, it's wide ranging and it's rambling, uh, but I, I think some good things get tweaked out about the responsibility of sovereignty, the responsibility of individual human beings uh, to help maintain order in society and uh, such things. So it's a good interview. Melton, what do you think? Well, and finally, uh, let me uh, jump in that I just have to mention from uh, my own sheer delight that uh, I uh, interviewed this uh, British uh, political scientist about his new biography on the Portuguese longtime dictator uh, Salazar, who evidently is uh, celebrated by some uh, American uh, Catholic uh, integralist. So uh, in response to my uh, interview, an editor at American Conservative, who I believe was also the founding editor of uh, the online journal, The Jacobite, whose views you can imagine uh, celebrated that in effect I had was uh, surrendering to integralism by having this semi, uh, as he perceived it, favorable uh, interview about uh, Salazar. So uh, I enjoyed that uh, moment. Uh, Mark Melton, uh, how do you feel about uh, integralism and Salazar? <laughs> well, I, I actually haven't uh, read the transcript from the Salazar thing, but the kind of my, uh, I find the integralist debate very much a ivory tower discussion now. Um, when I had last year, there was a spike in interest in the uh, topic and I did like a Google search like where were these people coming from and a large number of them I think actually came from the DC suburbs, which I thought was interesting DC suburbs and also some places around New York And so when I see people who are writing and talking about this, they seem to be in those areas That doesn't mean the idea won't spread and won't um, Get into other discussions, but when I talk about integralism to I don't know anyone else outside of Providence circles, I have to spend about 15 minutes to explain what I'm talking about because they don't know what I'm talking about. Well, you're so, not going to the right Catholic happy hours. I, I don't go to Catholic happy hours. Um, <laughs> so, but the, um, one of the things that I'm kind of been writing an article on this and hopefully we'll get it out soon is the, to me, religious liberty is um, the best way to really increase the practice of faith. Like when I lived in Europe, um, in places where the Catholic Church used to have a huge influence or still has a huge influence in different ways, practice was very, I would say, very low. Like I would go to church and either be difficult to find a church or be difficult to find a church that was vibrant. Probably the most vibrant place in Europe that I saw was in St. Andrews, but that was because I think a lot of churches emphasized um, the, you know, participating, like trying to reach out to college students there. But the compared to like living in Mississippi where there's a church on every corner. And so the idea to me is that um, when you increase the uh, religious freedom, you increase a religious market um, where enterprising uh, churches can spring up and serve the needs of the people. And so my concern with kind of the direction of integralist thought is that it would kind of diminish that. But again, I kind of see it as an ivory tower discussion. Like I don't, um, I know they they would probably denounce me on Twitter for this stuff, but I they don't. Should, and hopefully they will. But uh, as we understand it, you as a Mississippi Presbyterian are not embracing the integralist agenda. No, it, it, like the logic just does not compute for me. Um, on a lot of the points they make, it just doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't compute. Right, you are. Mark Melton and Mark Levecki, thank you for another uh, titillating uh, conversation of. Uh, Marxism and until Monday evening and our Christian realism happy hour. Bye-bye.